So hello and welcome to this introduction to culture series NPTO course where we're looking at Judith Butler's gender trouble. Uh, so as we said, sort of said the last couple of lectures, we are done with the text and now we're looking at the conclusion because I believe the conclusion is a very useful sort of text to summarize the entire discourse that Butler had offered to us. Uh, and also it proposes some ideas which are quite radical in nature as well, quite radical in quality as well. So we'll just continue with the conclusion now and hopefully we'll just wind up uh, very, very soon. So this is page uh, 186 on your screen where we're looking at the section uh, in a, where Butler talks about the um, artificiality of the natural body and this is the, uh, the paragraph on the screen which is about to finish where she says, um, just as bodily surfaces are enacted as the natural, so these surfaces can become the site of a dissonant and denaturalized performance that reveals the performative status of the natural itself. And that's, a, that's a key phrase over here which is worth uh, reading and paying attention to the performative status of the natural itself. So in, according to Butler, there is no pre-discursive natural and this is something that she talked about already. And there's no pre-discursive self, there's no pre-discursive I, uh, you know, which can be reified and romanticized, etc. So it is a, a fallacy in argument, she says, uh, to look at the I in contestation with an artificial other, uh, with, in contestation with an artificial sort of discursive field. The I is always already embedded in the discursive field. So again, we're back to this question of uh, the entanglement between identity and corporeality. So identity cannot be divorced from corporeality. So corporeality is part of identity and the entire performance and production of identity. So uh, quite clearly she says that a, that a performative state is sort of natural. So a natural, what we pass off, what we consider as natural, what we consume as natural, uh, always already contains the performative in it. In other words, uh, you can substitute the word performative with discursive, right? So the natural always already contains a discursive quality embedded in it, okay? And you can't possibly uh, divorce the discursivity from the natural identity. There's no natural identity which is not discursive in quality, according to Butler. Uh, and then she comes back to the, the significance and the politics of parody and how parody, to what extent is parody an important tool uh, to foreground the artificiality, to foreground the performative quality of identity, right? So parody becomes, a pastiche becomes a very important tool, a very important instrument that dramatizes and spectacularly makes visual the performative artificial quality of identity. And uh, she says quite clearly, and this is on the screen away up, the practices of parody can serve to re-engage and reconsolidate the very distinction between a privileged and naturalized gender configuration and one that appears as a derived, phantasmatic and mimetic, a failed copy as it were. So, um, you know, practice of parody can actually uh, be used for status quo. Practices of parody can actually sometimes consolidate this binary uh, between a privileged, naturalized gender configuration and a phantasmic, uh, you know, phantasmatic and mimetic configuration, a failed copy as it were. And if you remember, uh, she had said quite clearly, and this is what we discussed in a previous lecture uh, and a couple of lectures before that as well, where she said that any act of identification or any act of identity formation or production is basically an act of you know, confirmation. It's trying to conform to something. It's trying to conform to certain code, right? And this act of conform confirmation or conformity uh, always uh, ends up being an incomplete act, always ends up being a failed act. But then she talks about how this failure or this incompletion, an act of uh, conformity or confirmation can actually contain a subversive potential. So this gap between the original and the mimetic, this gap can actually be, a, you know, can carry subversive uh, potential, can carry radical possibilities, which might re-question, which might open up you know, the entire politics of gender and produce uh, plural possibilities, you know, open up for further questions, uh, further combinations, further permutations, etc. Okay. Uh, and surely, and she goes on to say, and surely parody has been used to further a politics of despair, one which affirms a seemingly inevitable exclusion of marginal genders from the territory of the natural and the real. So parody can be used as a politics of despair to further, to extend the politics of despair, which affirms the sort of inevitable conclusion, exclusion of marginalized gender from uh, the natural and the real. So obviously when she says natural and real genders, uh, she is talking about actually about intelligible genders, so intelligible identities of gender, which obviously fit in or approximate, if, if not fit in, but approximate the dominant codes of gender behavior, the dominant codes of gender identity. And parody 
uh, can be seen, can be used as an instrument uh, to further the division between this approximated intelligible identities of gender and the marginalized identities of uh, sort of the other kinds of gender uh, you know, configurations, uh, the drag being a good example of that kind of a parody. Adhida's failure to become real and to embody the natural is, I would argue, a constitutive failure of all gender enactments for the very reason that these ontological loc locales are fundamentally uninhabitable. So it's a very key uh, issue that she's raising, a very key definition, a very key uh, sort of description that she's saying that there's ontological locales, there's ontologically determined identities, there's ontologically privileged identities are fundamentally uninhabitable. Right? You cannot actually inhabit, you cannot actually occupy, you cannot actually um, ontologize yourself perfectly uh, into these gender norms. So every act of failure, uh, the failure to conform, the failure to become real, the failure to become natural uh, is actually a very common failure according to Butler. And she says this failure becomes spectacular uh, in certain kinds of gender identities, just the homosexual, the drag, uh, the lesbian identities where this failure, the so-called failure to conform uh, to the dominant code becomes spectacular, becomes visible, uh, become sort of very, very foregrounded. However, she says even within the normative, the quote-unquote normative heterosexual matrix, there too there's a failure to conform to the, you know, the ontological locale, the ontological privileged identity because, you know, this is actually an ontology which is a construct, it's a fantasy, right? And you cannot really conform to a fantasy completely. So, you know, these ontological locales, this sort of ontologized uh, identities are fundamentally uninhabitable. You cannot really inhabit those uh, fundamentally, you cannot just inhabit those completely. Right? So there is always this slippage, there is always this failure, there is always this gap between the dominant desirable identity and the real experiential identity of the gender. Okay? So, hence there is a subversive laughter in the pastiche effect of parodic practices in which the original, the authentic and the real are themselves constituted as effects. So again, we're back to this question of subversive laughter, right? So the subversive laughter is produced when uh, there's this pastiche effect, this hollowed out effect, where the original, the authentic and the real are themselves you know, constituted as effects. So what happens uh, in, a, in, a, in a case of certain kind of pastiche where the ontologically privileged identity, the ontologically authentic identity, the ontologically real identity, they themselves become effects. They themselves become, you know, you know, sort of objectives of parody, objectives of pastiche, uh, objectives of derision, etc. Those become the effects of parody, the effects of pastiche, right? So that therein lies the true subversive laughter, according to Butler. Okay, the loss of gender norms would have the effect of proliferating gender configurations, destabilizing substantive identity and depriving and the naturalizing and narratives of compulsory heterosexuality of the central protagonist, man and woman. So, uh, you know, this kind of a loss of gender norms would have the effect of proliferating gender identities. And what this proliferation does, it destabilizes substantive identity, right? It destabilizes what is the ontologically privileged identity and depriving the naturalizing narratives of compulsory heterosexuality of the central protagonist, man and woman. So this idea of naturalizing narratives is very, very important because these are narratives which are naturalized through acts of reputation, uh, through acts of ontologization, etc. But you know this kind, this kind of a pastiche where the loss of gender norms, uh, the pastiche obviously is non-normative in quality more often than not. And this kind of a pastiche oftentimes proliferates certain kinds of configurations which denaturalizes the narratives of compulsory heterosexuality, right? So, you know, the whole idea of naturalizing this sort of compulsory heterosexuality is obviously a discursive act, right? So, a discursive quality of these narratives lies precisely uh, in the act of naturalization. And also, I mean, we talked about how um, naturalization and concealment go hand in hand. So, on one hand, you need to naturalize, you need to repeat uh, certain kinds of discursive quotes over and over again just so they become naturalized to the point of being unquestionable. And equally and more importantly, it is also important uh, to conceal the constructed quality of those quotes so that you don't really find out these are quotes which have been constructed through artificial discursive processes. Because if you manage to conceal them, 
then obviously they are, you know, it's more easy for you to pass them off as givens, to pass them off as, as universal totalizing categories, right? But what this, this kind of a passage does, it, it, it deliberately become, makes gender non-normative. And by making gender non-normative, it denaturalizes those, those natural narratives uh, which make heterosexuality compulsory, which make heterosexuality dominant discursive code for gender behavior. That kind of a dominance, that kind of a legitimacy is delegitimized, denaturalized in acts of pastiche, according to Butler. So the parodic reputation of gender exposes, as well as the uh, as well the illusion of gender identity as an intractable depth and inner substance. So you know this is what Butler has been critical of so far throughout this, this particular thesis, and that there is this assumption uh, of an interiority of gender, this assumption of a pre-discursive or non-discursive interiority, which according to Butler doesn't exist, right? And what Butler says over here is quite radical, and she says this acts with reputation, this parodic reputation, not normative reputation, but parodic reputation. What this parodic reputation, this pastiche reputation does, uh, uh, do rather well is that it exposes uh, the illusion of interiority. The interiority, this gender interiority, this, the sense of having a core self of gender, a core masculine self, a core feminine self, this particular illusion, this particular fantasy is exposed as an illusion, is exposed as a fantasy. How? By this parodic acts of reputation. So this acts of reputation are excessive in quality, this acts of reputation are obviously parodic acts of reputation are excessive in quality, spectacular in quality, uh, hyperbolic in quality oftentimes and obviously taken together they are non-normative in quality. So this non-normativity uh, of these parodic reputations make them uh, sort of very well equipped to expose the, the illusion of substance, the illusion of interiority, the illusion of real depth. Okay? And again this idea of depthlessness, this idea, the celebration of depthlessness that uh, Butler is sort of doing over here, uh, this idea of uh, necessary, uh, you know, superficiality being this this organic condition, superficiality being this necessary condition, uh, you know, anything apart from superficiality is a discursive, uh, you know, uh, investment. This kind of an idea, this kind of a, you know, analysis uh, allies Butler quite remarkably well with the postmodernist kind of an, a work on superficiality uh, because in postmodernism too, we have the sen sense of centerlessness center cannot hold, it opens up to plural possibilities, it denies depth, it decries uh, any idea of interiority uh, and obviously it delegitimizes uh, any sort of depth based analysis, right? And that obviously is a very postmodern thing to do and this is something that Butler is doing over here as well. So as the effects of a subtle and politically enforced performativity, gender is an act. And this is what you know, we've been talking about since the very inception of this, this is the very beginning of this kind of a text that we've been studying, that we need to look at gender as an activity, as an act. It's a verb, right? So if we are to assign uh, a part of speech to gender, uh, it would not be an adjective, it would rather be a verb because it's an act, it's a process, it's an activity which is sort of subversive in quality, which is conforming in quality, etc., depending on the human situation, depending on the sort of the order of embodiment at any given point of space and time. Okay, so as a subtle, so when gender occurs, when gender emerges as a subtle and politically enforced performativity, it becomes an activity, as it were that is open to splittings, self-parody, self-criticism and those hyperbolic exhibitions of the natural that in a very exaggeration reveal its fundamentally phantasmatic status. So hyperbole, exaggeration, these become sort of very strategic maneuvers uh, in this kind of a gender identity which is produced through performativity. So Butler says over here that you know, when you look at gender uh, as some kind of a parodic reputation, as some kind of a parodic performance, uh, parodic performativity, we need to sort of take into account that this kind of um, an activity is hyperbolic in quality, it's deliberately designed to be exaggerated, it's deliberately designed to be hyperbolic. And this sense of hyperbole, this sense of exaggeration, what it does very well according to Butler is that it reveals its fundamentally phantasmatic status. So it reveals a fantasy. Uh, of interiority, it reveals a fantasy of ontological origin, it reveals a fantasy of depth, it reveals a fantasy of substance. So this acts of parodic reputation, uh, it hollows out the idea of gender uh, over and over again. So parody or pastiche over here 
especially when it corresponds to gendered performance, the way the Butler studies it, uh, through self-parody, splittings, opening up, etc. Uh, that becomes obviously acts of deconstruction, uh, dramas of deconstruction, you might say. And those dramas of deconstruction, uh, what it does is that it really opens up, it exposes uh, the hollowness, uh, the, the entire sort of fantasy, the entire myth, the entire unreality about real gender. The, the entire you know, reality about what gender being some kind of a core substance, uh, some kind of a core substance with depth, with interiority, etc. So that is exposed as a myth, that is exposed as a fantasy according to these particular performances, by and through these particular performances. Okay. So, and then she goes on to say, I uh, tried to suggest that the identity category is often presumed to be foundational to feminist politics that is deemed necessary in order to mobilize feminism as an identity politics simultaneously worked to limit and constrain in advance the very cultural possibilities that feminism is supposed to open up. So uh, she had said this before and she's sort of obviously repeating what she said, uh, summarizing it in a more condensed uh, form. And then she says one needs to be careful while looking at the identity politics and feminism because sometimes, oftentimes, um, these identity politics, they end up being entrapped uh, in the same kind of patriarchal discourse which they're supposed to question, right? And this happens uh, when Butler, you know, Butler says, Butler analyzes, whenever there is a totalizing and universalizing tendency uh, in these identity politics. So, so these identity politics need to be so sort of carefully maneuvered with, right? Uh, you know, these are uh, you know, necessary to, to mobilize feminism, etc. However, the same identity politics sometimes work to limit and constrain in advance the very cultural possibilities that feminism is supposed to open up. In other words, what she's saying over here is there's this danger of being dogmatic. Uh, there's this uh, uh, danger of being you know, embedded in a closure, right? So these identity politics sometimes uh, sort of they, they end up being a closure which doesn't open up to other cultural possibilities uh, offered at other points of historical space and time. Okay. So, the tacit constraints that produce culturally intelligible sex ought to be understood as generative political structures rather than naturalized foundations. So, this is a binary, this is, this is what she's questioning. So, rather than looking at these kind of tacit constraints, sort of mutually agreed constraints of gender and gender identities or gender performativity, uh, rather than looking at these constraints as uh, naturalized foundations as biologically true givens rather than looking at it from a sort of deterministic standpoint. We need to understand, we need to analyze and examine these things as generative political structures or artificially designed or created political structures, right? So rather than looking at it as a natural foundation, we need to understand these as or examine these as artificially produced or artificially engineered discursive structures and political structures, okay? So paradoxically, the reconceptualization of identity as an effect that is as produced or generated opens up possibilities of agency that are insidiously foreclosed by positions that take identity categories as foundational and fixed. So this is again a very radical thing that Butler is saying over here and she says quite clearly that true agency can only come with a recognition of artificiality. True agency can only form, uh, can only come, but only, only emerge with a recognition of discursivity, right? So as long as you uh, recognize, acknowledge, uh, and so address the sort of discursivity around you, the artificiality around you, the constructed quality of life, the constructed quality of language, the constructed quality of embodiment around you, only then can you produce true agency. So true agency uh, cannot come uh, from identities which are foundational and fixed. Right. So, you know, you cannot really say, uh, I, I have agency, a counter butler, you can't really say, yeah, I have agency because I happen to be a woman, a real woman, a real man uh, with an inner substance which is masculine in quality and, you know, I should derive my agency from my interiority which is masculine or feminine in quality. Now, if you say that, obviously you're getting trapped in foundational categories according to Butler and these foundational categories foreclose any possibility of agency. So, agency can only emerge uh, by positions in discursive conditions, right? By manoeuvrings in discursive conditions, by uh, engaging with discursive conditions at different points of time, okay? So, for an identity to be an effect means that it is neither fatally determined nor fully artificial and arbitrary. So, there is a liminality uh, in identity formation. So, it, it is neither fatally or bi biologically determined, neither is it fully artificial or arbitrary. 
right? And so therein lies, again, we, we sort of back to saying what we have been sort of defining at the beginning of this particular course, that is there is an entanglement between organicity and artificiality, right? Between interiority and you know, externality, between uh, sort of materiality and abstraction. So it, it is neither totally material, neither is it totally abstract. So identity sort of should be seen as a liminal condition. Uh, as a threshold condition, negotiating or maneuvering between artificiality and you know, arbitrary artificiality, one might say, uh, and fatally determined quality. Right. So neither is it totally biologically determined, neither is it arbitrarily artificial. So it's somewhere between the two, somewhere negotiating between these two categories, um, you know, in a very liminal kind of a way. That the constituted status of identity is misconstrued along these two conflicting lines suggests the ways in which the feminist discourse on cultural construction remains trapped within an unnecessary binarism of free will and determinism. Right? So there should be uh, an escape from this binary between free will and determinism. So neither is identity completely free will, neither is identity completely deterministic in quality. So there's no such thing as pure free will uh, and there's no such thing as pure determinism. Right? So there's this and this acknowledgement of impurity, this acknowledgement of entanglement is what makes identity process or identity politics possible in the first place. Okay, and next she gives a really radical statement which I think so sort of is one of those statements which stand out uh, in this entire text where she says that construction is not opposed to agency. So construction is not the ontological opposite of agency, but rather it is a necessary scene of agency, the very terms in which agency is articulated and becomes culturally intelligible. So it is only through construction, it is only through discursivity that agency can be articulated. So you cannot really derive agency by being pre-discursive or being non-discursive because then you know, you, you, don't, you don't get agency at all there. You get a myth, a fantasy of agency, but true agency is not opposed to construction. True agency is not opposed to discursivity. It's only through dealing with discursivity, it's only through maneuvering with discursivity can one arrive an, to, to an articulation of agency. So agency can only be articulated through discursivity, through construction, etc. You can only intelligibly articulate agency through a discursive process, not by escaping discursivity, but rather by negotiating with discursivity. Okay, that's a very important thing. The construction is not opposed to agency. It's one of the sentences which hopefully will stay with you uh, as long as you're interested in critical theory, as long as you're interested in cultural studies. The construction is not opposed to agency. Okay, it's a really beautifully written um, phrase as well. So the critical task for feminism under the circumstances is not to establish a point of view outside of constructed identities. So that, you know, that, that, that should not be the aim of feminism to look for a point of view outside the constructed identities. It's only within the constructed identities can we have a sense of agency, can we have an, you know, an intelligible agency that can be articulated. That conceit is the construction of an epistemological model that would disavow its own cultural location and hence promote itself as a global subject. So you know that kind of a view, point of view where you look for agency outside of constructed identities, that itself is an epistemological construct. Okay, and that's a very important topic, that's a very important point that Butler is raising over here. So she's saying that this, this, this attempt to look at agency, this attempt to look at identity outside the constructed categories, that attempt itself is a construct, right? And it's a kind of construct which allies itself, epistemologically speaking, it allies itself with you know, this entire universalizing project, this entire totalizing project, the total global project, etc. A position that deploys precisely the imperialist strategies that feminism uh, ought to criticize. So in other words, to put it very bluntly, what Butler is saying essentially over here is, you know, if we uh, are looking for identities, if, we look, if you're looking for agency outside the constructive categories, you know, that kind of a model, that kind of an attempt in itself becomes a construct, but it's a very sinister kind of a construct because it allies itself epistemologically to the universalizing tendency. And the same universalizing tendency, the same universalizing and totalizing viewpoint is exactly what informed imperialism. And this is something that feminism ought to critique. In other words, feminism must attempt not to become a grand narrative. And this is exactly how a grand narrative functions. Every grand narrative looks for a sort of 
sense of legitimization or derives its legitimacy from a seemingly meta discursive position, you know, something which is outside discourse. So, I mean, this is something I've said already. In order for something, in order for a discourse to become grand narrative in the first place, uh, it must assume uh, a universalizing sort of dress. It must assume a universalizing rhetoric, right? So that it doesn't get exposed as a construct in the first place. So, you know, it's a very carefully concealed construct. So concealment again becomes very important. But however, Butler says quite clearly away um, that feminism ought to critique this kind of a tendency, right? It ought to critique any idea of a meta discursive quality. Because everything through agency, through identity, through articulation, through authority can only come from within the discursive field. So there's no outside the discursive field. It's like the Derridan statement, there's no outside of the text. There's always textual and quality, right? So every act activity, every identity production, uh, every act of articulation, uh, every act of uh, sort of uh, you know agency, etc., is part of a discursive field. There's no outside of a text. It's all a part of a text textual process, right? So this textual performativity is something that what one has to be careful about all the time. There's nothing a textual. Uh, there's nothing non-textual about identity in the first place. So the critical task, this is page 188 on his screen, the critical task is rather to locate strategies of subversive reputation enabled by those constructions, to affirm the local possibilities of intervention through participating in precisely those practices of reputation that constitute identity and therefore present the immanent possibility of contesting them. So the key words over here are, uh, are local strategies. So to locate strategies of subversive reputation that enable those constructions to so affirm the local possibilities, right? So the local possibilities obviously are uh, sort of ontologically opposed to grand narratives. So local possibilities are local narratives, micro narratives, right? And again, we can go back and sort of draw on Leotard over here, and we find the remarkable resonance between Leotard and Butler in terms of what they're saying over here, in terms of cautioning us or cautioning feminist um, uh, theorists uh, against any kind of a totalizing tendency, any kind of a universalizing narrative which can become a grand narrative by default, by extension. Okay? So only through local possibilities of intervention, that's a very beautiful phrase, local possibilities of intervention uh, through participating in precisely those practices of reputation that constitute identity and therefore present the immanent possibility of contesting them. So what is to be contested over here, uh, you know, is any idea of a grand narrative, any idea of a universalizing narrative, right? Any idea of a meta-discursive narrative. So there's nothing called meta-discursive, there's nothing called non-discursive narrative in the first place. So any claim at non-discursivity should be contested and it can only be contested through local possibilities of intervention. So intervention can only come from local possibilities, not from universalizing or grand possibilities. Uh, of identity and agency. Okay, so I'll stop this lecture here today. Uh, so we're just winding up with Butler, and we'll hopefully finish with that in another lecture. But you know, just go through the sections where we said we we re we're looking at this particular uh, you know, uh, conclusion very carefully. We're doing it line by line, quite literally, and that's because it is a very beautiful summary of the entire book. Uh, you know, we obviously selected certain sections of the book in terms of examining it closely, but the conclusion I think uh, needs to be read carefully and in some details in order to glean what Butler is saying throughout this particular text, which, as I said, is a very seminal text in terms of understanding the alliance between uh, post structuralism uh, post-modernism, and gender politics and gender theory. Uh, so, thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next lecture where we'll continue with this particular text. Thank you.